coming up in this episode. Supplements are now being used as sort of molecules to really alternate the aging process. For the anti-aging sort of supplements, it's the same. First analyze what you need and then take it. Can consumers do it themselves? Um, very often I hear, okay, what you do is just for the richest rich, blah, 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 blah. I don't think so. We are at the moment. What were main talking points that stood out to you from the conference? I am aging. I would love to have my dashboard every morning. Okay, manipulate a little bit this and this. Maybe don't do that and I can make then a choice. Very importantly is now to take ourselves seriously. And what do I mean with it? Hi guys, welcome to an episode of Health Kicks Podcast. In this episode, I have with me Professor Andrea Meyer and will be commenting on the very recent supplement conference, specifically our main takeaways. For that, just a quick update. Three main things to improve your content experience. Firstly, there will be links mentioned throughout this video and you can find those links in the description. Secondly, your VO2 max and your strength, among all the other biomarkers, are the greatest predictor of how long you're going to live. Hence, my team has launched a sports and healthy aging lab to help you improve in these two areas in ways that can save you up to 90% time as compared to traditional methods. As you might know, improving strength and your VO2 max in the shortest amount of time in a safe way gets increasingly difficult as you age. And that's probably why we have seen many CEOs and senior executives walk in through our doors when we launched the lab this month. More about how we do things as well as the science in the next video. Feel free to subscribe to be notified when the video is out. Speaking of which, the last point is we are close to a thousand subscribers. That mark is one of the criteria for us to monetize our videos through YouTube. And so if you enjoy our content and you'd like to see better quality in the future, please hit that subscribe button. That's all for now. Back to the episode. Good morning, Professor. Thank so, you for having me. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you for coming on to the show. All right. Um, first question to you is what were main talking points that stood out to you from the conference? So first of all, it was a conference with lots of excitement. Um, there were so many participants that we were sold out. Yeah. Um, there were so many sponsors who really ran out of the product. And there were so many speakers who just wanted to come. Yeah. So it was a great success, which means that the topic supplements really mean something uh, for the ecosystem of the field. You know, that supplements are now being used as sort of molecules to really alternate the aging process. And this was the first conference really bringing all the expertise together, but also bringing together the industry partners to really make sure that we are aligned. Uh, next to that, we also had the public day yep. uh, on Saturday with lots of uh, excitement. So which means that my really take away that the ecosystem of health and longevity medicine really now is embracing the, the supplement field and that we have industry partners. We have had really, really great um, presenters and we had a great audience with lots of questions and lots of excitements. Another point my takeaway is that we need to regulate it maybe a little bit more. First of all, there were, and I was quite proud of it, regulators uh, in the room and really showcasing that where the field is, how we use supplements in the health and longevity medicine field and translational geroscience together where maybe caveats are in terms of the quality control, um, I think is is most exciting that we can really grow the field. Yeah, indeed. One of, one of my takeaways was the end of the whole conference, there was this supplements versus drug debate, which was a highlight, right? Uh, you moderated that. Yeah, and before that, earlier in the conference, you also presented your own slides um, where you mentioned supplements, reality, but human translation is limited. Studies are small. That was one of the pointers on your conclusion slide. Yeah. Would you care to elaborate a little bit on it for people who might not have attended the conference as well as for people who want it summarized? Yeah, so unfortunately, we do not have many well-conducted randomized controlled trials yet in humans, but they are coming. Um, so that's a good point. Uh, so first of all, let's start with the basics. So we understand the aging process. We have molecules who could interfere with the aging process. Um, this has been trialed in animal models. Uh, think about 
you listen A, think about EKG, think about spermidin, physitin, eicotinamide mononucleotide. Are there any deep precursors? So we have lots of understanding and we have lots of evidence in animal studies. For a couple of these supplements, these were transferred into the human space. We ourselves at the National University of Singapore Young Lulin School, we do studies, for example, with alpha ketoglutarate. We did studies with nicotinamide mononucleotide. And we now translate the knowledge to really prove that it makes sense to give it in humans in clinical practice or that consumers uh, take it. So we need many more of these randomized control trials. Uh, some will, no randomized control trial will fail, but some of them will have negative results, which is, which is fine. I think one of the examples is resveratrol. It worked in, uh, in animal studies in some of the labs. It has been translated into humans and the randomized control trials are negative. Not negative, that's a negative trial, but the negative outcomes. Very well conducted randomized control trials. So what we really have to do in the next coming, I would say months and years, is having much, much more of these randomized control trials, well conducted, uh, larger, that we actually know if there is efficacy, which means that the supplement you are taking is, is working. So on that note, just a couple of questions, because one of the things you mentioned during the conference was also the NUS research pipeline that's going ahead. And the other thing it's for the end consumers, how do we then understand this research and decide for ourselves whether, yes, this is the right time to pick it up or no, maybe sometime later down the road? Yeah. So two points here. So first of all, all the listeners participate in our randomized control trials because without you, we cannot actually do studies. And therewith, there is no evidence in the consumer market that something works or doesn't work. So please um, be our guest to really participate in the randomized control trials. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're watching from overseas, there are everywhere there are research centers who, are, who need participants. So participation, first of all. The second thing, if I look at consumers and lots of people ask me, okay, what should I take? I said, nothing if you don't know who you are. So, <laughs> so what, what do I mean? Um, I just explained that we have molecules uh, antagonizing the aging process. Everybody is aging a little bit differently. We understand, I think that's also a debate, but we understand in my view what aging is, but everybody has a different sort of problem in the aging, aging process. There might be that for one. Uh, autophagy has to be upregulated for the other one. Proteins has to have to be stabilized. For, for another person, there are too many senescent cells and they need different approaches. As a normal conventional medicine, first you analyze where the need is and then you are finding an intervention which is targeting that need. So if we are talking about supplements, it should be the same. It doesn't help, for example, if somebody takes vitamin B12 for a vitamin D deficiency. There's a mismatch. It will not help. Again, for the anti-aging sort of supplements, it's the same. First analyze what you need and then take it. Can consumers do it themselves? Um, I doubt that because it's highly complicated. It's complex. Um, there's new science, how we analyze where the biology of a, of a human uh, is. And then it needs a dedicated approach. So you need somebody who really studied it and has knowledge about it. Yeah, in fact, one of the booths at the conference was, I think there were two, actually, measuring the NED level. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. So there's lots of debate with regards to NED levels. What is the right kit? Uh, we do studies at the Young Lin School to actually to, to now compare all the kits to see what their reliability is. So does it measure what it should measure? Is it, is it aligned? Uh, and I think that's very interesting because in the end, the consumer should actually have consumer tools to be able to make, make choices. Not everything should be medicalized. Absolutely not. But any D levels to measure it absolutely makes sense. Our recent publication in GeroScience actually shows that first, if we measured any D levels, we gave uh, an amino, we measured again, that this is highly um, beneficial to have a greater clinical outcome and a better clinical outcome. Um, and it makes sense because if you're looking at normal medicine, nobody would inject insulin 
in somebody without knowing what the glucose level is. Nobody would give an antihypertensive drug without measuring the blood pressure and measuring it, of course, again. So the same for supplements. NED level measurements, NMN supplementation, NED level, again, measurements to see if there was a change. Because if there is not a change, what do you do? Again, you're measuring the blood pressure, you're giving a drug, and you want, most of the times, the blood pressure to be lower. Same uh, for, for supplements. Measuring vitamin D level, taking vitamin D supplements, measuring it again if you have the right dosage. And that's the future. Yeah, it sounds like different partners in the ecosystem growing alongside each other yeah. to enable consumers to benefit, right? Um, on that note, for newer industries, regulations, as you have covered just now, it's great to have regulators in the conference as well. Regulations are typically, well, they need time to catch up, mm -hmm. right? For newer industries. One of the things mentioned was that it is hard to enforce the quality of supplements for at least in what, what you found in Singapore, mm -hmm. one of the studies done by Dr. Elena. Yes, Sandalova. Yeah, yes, my group, yeah. Yep, yep. Moving forward, how do you see regulations being a better ecosystem player, making sure our supplements industry grow properly? Yeah, so th there could be two strategies. Either you regulate everything <laughs> or you give the power to the industry and you make sure that the quality is good. So what we did is we tested different supplements on the label claim, which means is the quality this, the, the one which is actually written uh, on the bottle. Yes, the bottle and supplements most of the time looks nice, it's colorful, or it's, it's very well designed and people then buy it. The question is, is the content what's actually written outside uh, on, the, on the bottle? So... To make sure, and, and, and it's quite negative. So there are lots of supplements having not the ingredient or having much, much more little of uh, what it should be in the, in the bottle. So there's a problem. So either we say everything should be regulated. Um, that, that could be an, an idea, but where do you start and where do you stop? Secondly, I think what we need to do, and that's the reason why we did the study, we just have to showcase, hey, guys, this is the quality. Is this what we want to stand for? Yes or no? And I think unanimously the answer, at least at the conference, was no, yeah. because we want high quality. So there might also be a self-regulation. Well, it's good to understand that as well, uh, especially as a consumer yeah. making choices. Yeah, because the... you want like to know, so I get lots of questions, what should I take? Yeah. <laughs> first, and I get the answer, give the answer. Okay, first, only if you need it, and then again, uh, contact me. <laughs> oh, yeah, and the other thing you mentioned as well is that studies are small. This is when one of your yeah. conclusion slides. So am I right to assume, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, Yeah. Right. if studies are larger, meaning like a large study show a clear benefit for a particular supplement, it would be game-changing for the industry. Is it as straightforward as that? Realistically, how far are we from something like that? Yeah, so... But first of all, yes, it would be a game changer because then we would have a an intervention to slow down the aging process or to reverse the aging process or to manipulate at least the aging process. Absolutely. And we have a couple of these smaller studies who actually show um, clinically relevant changes of the physiology. So there is something happening and we can actually detect that. But very importantly is now to take ourselves seriously. And what do I mean with it? If I look at conventional medicine, if we're interfering in, an, in a disease process, in the end, we do large trials. We do large trials with thousands of individuals and actually show what the proportion is of individuals who is benefiting from that intervention. But also showcasing how many individuals do not benefit and especially how many could have sightful harm, uh, side effects. So... I think this is what we really need to see who is a responder, who is not a responder. We are in an area at the moment where we try to speed things up because in the longevity field, there is a huge consumer push. The consumer push 
uh, is so big that lots of industry partners are kicking in, which is great. So we have lots of small, medium enterprises who really try to um, discover new formulations, new molecules, etc., and bringing that into the market. And that's great. However, we also need an academic side to actually showcase that, yes, what's on the market is actually working. And it's working for whom? And because there is such a consumer push, there are lots of people who want to stay healthier for longer. There is the market. Now the academics, we really have to speed up. And one of the possible solutions to do that is decentralized trials. So what I'm what what are decentralized trials? Decentralized trials are different from conventional trials. Normally, if you are in our studies, you're coming in for your visit. Uh, you get lots of assessments. And you're coming again. You're coming again, and you have to go into our research center, which is great. We love to to have participants there. However, that means that you can only do smaller trials because it's quite labor intensive. And um, it's just not not fast. Decentralized trials means that let's give the power to the participants in the study to measure themselves. Send the kids, kids home when it's convenient for you to do a stool sample or to do a saliva test, uh, etc. And there was being able to reach many more in a shorter period of time uh, and also make it less labor intensive and there was most of the times cheaper. So this is what we are trialing at the moment, how to do decentralized trials for health longevity uh, supplements, uh, but also for many more, more studies to reach the masses and to understand in whom it's working or not. So when you say this is what we are doing at the moment, is it something that is already rolled out? And We are rolling out the first study in the next coming uh, two to three uh, months. It's a big study where we decentralize the, uh, the trial. And um, giving the participant the power to, yeah, to measure. And information for this can be found somewhere. Yes, uh, I think we will highlight the the website, yeah, okay. the CHL website. Cool, cool. Speaking of which, what other projects are you up to, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, which not? Please <laughs> say so very importantly, our our main in my group we want to make sure that interventions work and we are testing interventions. So in interventions are supplement interventions, but also repurposed drugs. So supplement, think about an alpha ketoglutarate, think about a ULSNA, think about a mineral, a multi-mineral and vitamin pill, for example. Uh, we are testing all of these, but also repurposed drugs, like in the longer study. Very importantly for us is also now to bring knowledge to the community uh, because you ask okay people want to know what to take which means okay yes you need knowledge to yeah. make uh, a rational decision if, if you're a rational person so one of our big projects which is now worldwide uh, running is we call it the longevity knowledge we want to know what people know about health span and lifespan uh, what they care about in their life. Do they care about health? Do they, what their habits already are? Do they take supplements? Do they go to the GP? Do, you, do they go into annual health screenings? And then we ask also, would you like to go into a health longevity medicine clinic? Like, and do you know what that is? So we are running these surveys, not only in Singapore, but also in Indonesia, not only in, uh, in cities, but also quite rural to see what the gap is. Uh, we are running it in Switzerland. We are running it in the US and uh, in the Netherlands. So really a global survey to see what we have to provide. And education is being provided. And that's, I think we are very proud of it in the US that we now have an academy for health and longevity where we not only give intensive courses, but also talent incubators for youngsters, young in mind, uh, no, but also we are now preparing a medical doctor course because in the end, somebody has to bring the knowledge to the medical professionals and into clinical practice. So we need many more of these educational um, courses to grow the field. What you just mentioned, the clinical approach is kind of related to one of the 
points on your conclusion slides uh, during your presentation in the conference as well, where you stated, um, oh, this is similar to what you stated on the LinkedIn post, uh, precision, healthy, longevity based on phenotype, right? And you're, in your LinkedIn post, you say, let's work to, towards a precision medicine approach and titrate our geoprotective interventions to maximize the eye effect, yep. as we would normally do in medicine, right? But does this approach, um, well, the benefits are clear, t take longer for it to come to fruition? Um, so, again, here, we can speed things up in a way that we work towards precision health and longevity medicine. At least that's, that's my approach. Why would I invest lots in something which might not work where we have to trade it? And once again, I'm an internal medicine specialist. I'm a conventional medicine physician. I, I love what we created in the past 50 years in modern medicine because we learned that we are giving you the drugs you need. Um, and there's lots of progress, uh, for example, with pharmacogenomics, uh, that we have lesser side effects for individuals. So why would we not take the same approach also for the health and longevity medicine arena? So I really think that we can learn a lot. Um, let's do not do things as we did in the, in the 70s or 80s, for example, for cancer treatment. Everybody gets the same. We didn't know better at that moment in time, but now we know better. Um, that we can actually tailor the in interventions based on the biology of individuals. And I think that's the, the new arena of medicine um, in the next coming 10 years that we learn what's going on with you at this moment in time, because you are aging at this moment in time, I am aging, it would be so nice to have, I would love to have my dashboard every morning, okay, <laughs> manipulate a little bit this and this, Maybe don't do that. And I can make then a choice. It doesn't mean that knowing you, that you have to dictate it what you have to do. Absolutely not. There's so much choice then. But now we make choices just in a black box. We, of course, we do not know what's going on. Yeah, indeed. Um, speaking of which, from an end consumer, there's already a challenge, right? From a public health perspective, all governments, isn't that a even greater challenge to keep citizens healthier uh, unless more research is done. And on that front, are you guys doing anything uh, in particular? In the public health space? Yeah. Yes. So my goal is that we have to bring it into public health because it should not be very often I hear, okay, what you do is just for the richest rich, blah, 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 blah. But I don't think so. We are at the moment trialing what we can and could in five or 10 years time bringing it to the mass market into public health. There, there, there are two things. First of all, it's a public health as it is. I am an advisor of the United Nations Decade of Healthy uh, Aging with the WHO. We are talking about how to age healthier around the globe, around the world in the public health sector. Very often and in many, many countries, it's still to implement what we already know. And that should be the focus of public health. It's also happening here in Singapore. Salt intake, physical activity, sleep, all the things where we already have guidelines for at least a decade to implement it. Um, this is implementation science, what we need at this moment in time in public health. That's the first thing. So we have to act. Um, the second thing is, how to create a pipeline that for the public health sector in five years' time, we have the new WHO guidelines to actually say, no, not 10,000 steps should be for everyone, but you need a mix of steps of endurance, of balance, of strength training. And this, this mixture is good for you or for this group of individuals. So we have to make sure that in five years' time, Everybody agrees on that guideline around the world to implement it then into the public health sector. So what we are doing within translational geroscience, health and longevity medicine, is now in smaller scale to trial who is responding, who is not responding to, for example, lifestyle interventions, but also supplements, repurposed drugs, but take a twist of leave it at the moment with lifestyle interventions. What is good for that group of individuals? 
we have to make sure that we are super evidence-based backed. So we need lots of randomized controlled trials or other studies, new designs to make sure that we are building these guidelines. It's a new approved WHO guidelines that will then via implementation science, go into the execution around the world. So we are the fourth step, I would say, of implementation. Yeah, you just mentioned the timeline, five to 10 years, you want to see some of these guidelines go into the WHO guidelines. I'm just curious, with so many projects on your plate, are you growing your team? Are you hiring? Yes, I'm absolutely hiring. and um, But I would love to see not only my team growing, but the entire world growing. So that's the reason why we hugely invest, for example, in talent incubators. It's not a talent incubator by the NUS um, School of, of Medicine, the Young Lunin School, is not to just be there for two weeks. Young talents, if you want to find more, please look at longevityacademy.sg. It's not just having these individuals two weeks, but then forming alumni classes and forming really a very strong network around the world. That's what we need. But yes, if you're interested, you are passionate about this topic, please contact me. Even if you are not working in my group, we have a very strong network and we can dedicate and guide you towards other principal investigators to work in their groups. Most importantly, that we are building the grid. We are really building the network, being very strong, and it doesn't matter where you work, but that you are working and you are bringing your talent to the field. That's most important. That kind of leads me to a concluding question, which has two parts. One is with a whole spectrum of projects and the supplement conference with the Academy and Open Day uh, Sandwich. Um, what are some things that your team thinks, oh, maybe we should have achieved more? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so first of all, I have a great team and really uh, I am not doing it. The team is doing it. So we have the scientific committee, uh, we have the organizational team, we had a, a team for the intensive course, for the open day. And every every team member was so crucial to to open it up to the world that so many people, uh, more than 60% flew in internationally to actually come to Singapore and come to the NUS. So that really means that the NUS, the Young Lulin School of Medicine is now at the forefront to actually showcase, yes, like if you want to to have something come also Singapore, Singapore is the place. No, so, it. <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's, it's not me, it's, it's the team. Um, I don't think that we have what we did. Of course, there's always things to learn if you're organizing things. But what we really want to do is now drive the agenda for Asia. And we are even working now on the next <laughs> next conference uh, because there is a huge lag time between uh, that you are doing it, a lot of preparation beforehand. I think what the field is needs is good quality conferences, much more education, um, from a regulatory part, from a MD part, health uh, care professional part, I think conferences, bigger conferences are good once a year. I think most importantly is building also the local network, and that's what we are now doing. Uh, and the conference massively helped. So if you are watching from Singapore, you're a healthcare professional, just reach out because now we have a WhatsApp group and that's active. Like, what do you do? How do you do things? How do you establish the ecosystem? And now people are finding each other and building that strong network. And I think that's that's exciting and that's what we need. Cool. You actually answered my second question. I mentioned it was two parts. Second question was, what's the next big thing for the conference? Right? And you mentioned this in the pipeline. Yes, we are choosing a, um, a topic now for the conference. But I think most importantly is I'm excited about everything we we do at the moment um there is the talent incubator coming up which is super excited we have 40 already selective of youngsters who are coming to singapore uh, application closed so watch the next year and we are now working on the medical doctor course i think it is it's hugely exciting to also then see okay 
if we are bringing medical doctors and have an MD only uh, course, I do not want to exclude the really, really great physiotherapist or uh, psychologist and nurses. And we need everyone, but we have to start somewhere. That's the reason why we uh, have an MD course. But watch the space for other healthcare professionals because we need to have these courses certify and then hopefully grow grow in a very evidence-based way the, the field. Cool. With that, we end today's session. All the best for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, we'll be in touch sooner than later, I'm sure. Yes, thank you so much. And once again, it's a team doing it. So thank you. That's all for now. Till next time, take care. <laughs>